Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. This week, Aceto Corsa and Kunos have given us Bonus Pack 3. It is a free DLC for AC, and it features a whole bunch of really cool high-performance road and track cars, some of which are really great additions to the sim. But the centerpiece of Bonus Pack 3 definitely is Laguna Seca. There have been several mod versions of Laguna that have been out since the inception of Aceto Corsa back in 2014, but now, natively, we have it in the sim. It's been laser scanned. The modeling and everything at that place is absolutely tremendous. It's a wonderful addition natively now to Aceto Corsa Laguna Seca. However, that's not necessarily what we're here to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about this. Yeah, this is the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. This is a four-door sedan. Now, why is this here? What I don't want to do in this piece here today is hate on this thing. Some of you are probably quite keenly aware that when it comes to four-door cars in racing sims, I'm kind of at a loss. I don't truly understand what they're doing here. We're supposed to be driving race cars, high-performance road cars, track-only beasts, things like that. But every once in a while, we get a release like this, where this is quite a sensible, even somewhat pedestrian, family-type car that would look perfectly at home in the parking lot of any shopping mall. So why are we here? Why is the Giulia here? What I want to do here today is I want to see if this car can convince me that it deserves a place here in Aceto Corsa. Now obviously it's already here, I'm not going to have anything to say as to whether or not this car will continue to be included in the sim because it's already here to stay. However, I basically want to make peace with this, so let's find out if we can make peace with this. The car's name is interesting. First of all, it is an Alfa Romeo. That's how you pronounce the name of the company. The model name is Giulia. Giulia. It is not Guglia or anything like that. It is Giulia. It's the name Giulia, of course. It can be a female name. It's also the name of the car, Giulia. And then the second name of the car is Quadrifoglio. Now, it's an interesting name. Quadrifoglio, it refers to, first of all, this, the four-leaf clover emblem on the side of the car. Quadrifoglio is an Italian word that can mean four-leaf clover. Also, folio, it means sheet, as in a sheet of paper. It can also mean folio, as in a sheet of paper or a page. It can also mean a leaf on a tree. So, different terminology you've got here. Quadrifoglio, obviously meaning four sheets, four leaves. Also, that name alludes to the fact that this car has four doors and four seats. So, lots of metaphorical symbolism going on even just with the name of this car. You'd expect nothing less from the Italians. However, what have we got going on here with the Quadrifoglio? Well, it's interesting. It's obviously a four-door car. It's aimed for the somewhat upper-crust family man, basically. You've got pretty interesting performance, I must say. It's coming from a 2.9-liter twin-turbo V6 engine. It's putting out about 505 horsepower, give or take, so you've definitely got some grunt under the hood, but of course you've got four doors and four seats and a plush leather interior and all things of that nature, so certainly the car has got some performance behind it, but at the same time it remains practical, something that's totally streetable on the daily. Is that something that belongs in a racing sim? Aceto Corsa, obviously, it markets itself as a racing simulator, and it is a very good one at that. But cars like these, I remember last year when I took a look at the Maserati, Maserati Levante, we had basically nothing good to say about it, and I still stand by that. But this, it irks me, but not in the sense that I don't believe that it necessarily does not belong here. I believe that something has to be good about this car in order for it to have warranted a place here in Aceto Corsa, but what exactly is it? So that's what I'm endeavoring to find out today. Of course, looking at the interior and exterior details here, Kunos, once again, they have done an absolutely fantastic job inside and out with this car. I really like the detail here just on the front doors as they're sitting here swung open. Not only do you have the doors, they're shaped nicely and all of the texturing and modeling work is done very well inside and out, but you can also see the details of the seals, the rubber seals around the doors here to keep out the cold and water and stuff like that. You can also see the little 
catch there for the, the door latch where it slams shut and it all locks into place, of course, so the door doesn't fly open while you're driving. Nice detail. Really, it it is. I like the rear view mirror here. You can see that bezel work around the glass. Very, very cool indeed. And then obviously when we go in the car, we'll have a better look at the interior. But really, I, I like what Kunos have done with it, I must say. The wheels on this thing, very, very nice detail as well. It's a really cool five-spoke design. I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a straight line anywhere on those wheels. It's really, really cool. You've got your cross-drilled ventilated disc brakes inside and looks like we've got four piston calipers up front and I would expect nothing less on the rear. Yep. Same thing on the rear with the caliper detail. Very, very nice. Is wrapped in these Michelin tires, of course. Very nice detail there. Nice lettering that we can see on the sidewall, as well as that tread block detail. Definitely it's a high performance road tire, suited for wet or dry conditions, but probably not so well suited for snow. Looking around the back here, you can see that they've got some sort of faux diffuser detail going on. Yeah, it is what it is. The four exhaust that continues the four motif all over on this car. Four doors, four seats, four exhaust outlets. Definitely kind of cool, I must say. Across the rear valance detail here, you can see the little catches that hold the rear bumper in place. Nice detail there, as well as the deck lid and trunk. Just the slightest bit of, I suppose you might be able to call this a ducktail spoiler. Maybe, maybe not. Sorry, Porsche enthusiasts. But yeah, I would call it somewhat of a ducktail spoiler there done in carbon. Interesting little accentual touch. Of course, all of the details with the shaders and textures all across the car in the shadowed side, wonderful reflections here across the very nice body lines on this car, I must say. Looking around back toward the front, you can see these little air outlets, just the rears of the front wheels. This is probably to extract some hot air from the engine bay. Very cool. And then across the front fascia of this car, very nice grill detail, very nice radiator inlet detail here. And of course, the headlights, very, very nicely put together, I must say. Not bad, Kunos. Not bad at all. The headlights on these modern cars, whether they're road cars or race cars, I'm always marveling at them. Just, just have a look at the complexity of the geometry going on through here. So many different elements. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine individual bulb elements just on the front side of the headlight. And then the indicator light here, that's a tenth element inside there. And you can see all of that wonderful detailing work in there with the lensing. It's almost a fractal type detail. Really, really nicely done. Of course, just below the headlight, you can see this little square-ish area, this quadrilateral area. There are going to be a lot of four puns in this one, I could definitely tell. But that is the little nozzle where the headlight washer pops out when you hit the, the washer on the wiper stock. Really, really nice detail. Of course, through here, this little hatchway, you can call it, this little plug that comes out the front end. This is either for a tow hook, tow hook or for an engine block heater, I would imagine. Anyway, not bad detail, Kunos. Nicely done, I certainly must say. Let's open up the doors again and have a look at the inside of the Quadrifoglio. Come in here to the driver's office. You can see every indicator that's possibly on on the dashboard is on right now so you can see that we first of all have a six-speed manual gearbox now this is the european spec of the quadrifoglio the american spec the u.s spec does not come with the manual transmission a moment of silence now for the continued loss of the american manual transmission anyway this is the Euro spec then, quite obviously. You can see we have a pretty well-appointed interior, and for a car that's costing $80,000, I don't think you would expect anything less. It definitely looks comparable to the Mercedes, Audi, BMW, Porsche in this similar market. I don't really want to compare it with Acura or Lexus because I would put Alfa Romeo in a tier above those kinds of guys, but certainly it's market competitors, it's direct market competitors, your Audis, your Porsches, your Mercedes, your BMWs. This is certainly at least as well appointed as the interiors of cars of that particular genre, so nice effort once again from Alfa. 
you can see our dashboard it's somewhat simplistic but at the same time it also is well it's well it's well appointed you can see we've got a big tachometer on the left it red lines all the way up there at 8,000 rpm the engine doesn't rev that high in practice about six and a half is where it's going to get to before it picks up the rev limiter you can see that yellow bar with shift in it that's a, a quasi shift light I suppose you could call it it does come up when you start to approach the the red line there at about six and a half and then that's when you grab the next gear pretty self-explanatory steering wheel here you can see it has all of the expected accoutrement that you would get in your modern car controls for the the radio your cell phone integration seek um, start stop play all of that kind of thing and then of course you've got your engine stop start button there on the lower left of the steering wheel it's one thing that's kind of irking ir irking me a little bit i must say because i'm a firm believer that road cars should be simplistic i think that when you start to put more and more gadgets into road cars be it in the radio or be it with the driving dynamics things of that nature i think people start to get distracted they start to become disconnected from the the true task that is driving a car and i see it all the time when i'm on the road people get distracted they're not paying attention they're doing silly things that they probably know that they should not be doing but they're tuning their radio or they're answering their cell phone, things like that. And you're integrating all of these systems onto the steering wheel, which is the most important control, arguably, in any car. So you've got controls on a steering wheel, which is, of course, designed to drive the car. But all the other controls on a steering wheel have nothing to do with driving the car. Just me. It's a little bit of cognitive dissonance. I don't particularly like it. But that's been the design trend for quite some time now. And I don't see it changing anytime soon. Regardless of my rant, you can see here the interior detail, your center screen there that a lot of cars now have. You've got all of your icons up there for the phone navigation, things like that. Wonderful climate control vent detail, I must say. Hazard light in the middle there. And then your air vents, of course. Climate control for heat, air conditioning, fan speed, heated seats, all things of that nature. Over here by the shift knob, of course, you've got your stick. And it also looks like you've got some sort of suspension adjustment. So it's probably a snow ice setting, sport. There might even be a track mode in this car. I'm not really sure, but there it is. Looking across to the passenger side, first of all, you can see the center console here, the lid of it anyway, with very nice leather detail as well as, well as some red accent stitching. Of course, the passenger seat there. It's got some carbon detail along the sides. I'm not sure if that's actually structural to the seat or not, but it's a nice detail nonetheless. And then, of course, your rear seats. It is a proper 2 plus 2 but it does have two doors at the back as well, so if you could call it a 2 plus 2, maybe, maybe not, but it's definitely a sedan. We will definitely call it a sedan, but you could definitely accommodate four people quite comfortably in this car. Certainly you could accommodate five as well, but I'm not entirely sure how comfortable that person in the middle rear seat would be. Anyway, looking across the headliner detail here, everything very dark, everything somewhat businesslike in here, but it's pretty nice nonetheless. You can see sight lines in here. It's a road car, so sight lines are going to be quite good no matter which way you cut it. And then across on the driver's side door, you can see the door handle here to pop the door open. You can see more details. Looks like you've got a little joystick there on the left-hand side there where the, the driver's left arm could go. That's probably, if I had to guess, that's probably to control the infotainment system on that center screen, but I'm not really sure. Of course, the final detail there, your power window switches for all four windows, which are all electrically operated, of course. Down there in the footwell, you can see you've got your accelerator brake and clutch pedal. Very nice detail in there. And then, of course, all of your other stuff for some driving settings there on the left-hand side of the dashboard proper. All in all, not bad detail on this thing. Of course, we've come to expect nothing less from Kunos. And, of course, they have delivered once again. Very, very nice. Let's just go around to the passenger side and go back inside and see if we can find any other details in here. I've really not taken an in-depth look at this car before doing this. We did a live stream a couple of days ago just looking at most of the cars from Bonus Pack 3, and this was among them, but I did want to take a little bit more of an in-depth look at this one. In the center here, it's a little bit easier to see the center stack from the passenger view than it is from the driver view. You can see this large button slash knob slash touchpad I'm not entirely sure immediately behind the shifter in the center that's what I'm looking at it just looks like a gray button and 
I know that Mercedes and, and more recently BMW have brought in systems where they have handwriting recognition for these infotainment systems. I'm not entirely sure if that's what this is or if Alpha have simply decided to make an unusually large button and put it in the middle there, but I would not be surprised if that's some sort of handwriting integration something to try and navigate your infotainment without having to scroll through menus. If it is, good on them. If it's not, oh well. Passenger side foot well here. Alfa Romeo scuff plate, nice little touch there. I would feel bad, though, stepping on that every time I got in the car. It uh, almost seems a little bit disrespectful, but anyway, there it is. I don't think we can find any more details here from the passenger side. Again, you can see the other side of the rear seats now. Very, very cool. I do like that Alfa Romeo logo there emblazoned on the headrest. And then, of course, coming around the B-pillar area, seatbelt detail. It's your run-of-the-mill road car seatbelt. But nice detail nonetheless. We'll leave the interior now. And we will shut it up. Very, very nice. All in all, exterior detailing, very nice job once again from Kunos. They really do hit it out of the park with this modeling work inside and out. And of course, now we've become accustomed to them doing such good work, so they have delivered once more. And of course, it's not just here on the Quadrifoglio. It also is on every other car in Bonus Pack 3 and also pretty much every other car in the sim to date. So really nice job once again. However, this car has a lot of work to do for it to convince me that it's deserving of its place here in Aceto Corsa. And the only way it can do that is to allow me to drive it. So we're going to go to Laguna Seca, the centerpiece of Bonus Pack 3, and we're going to give this car a little bit of a thrashing and see just what it's all on about. We'll see you at Laguna next. Welcome to Laguna Seca. Before we get out on track, of course, we're going to have a look through the setup screen and show you what's going on here with the Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio. On the gear display, you can see we've got a six-speed gearbox fixed ratios. It's a road car. It's not designed for you to play with it, so we can't play with it. Tires, two compounds to choose from. Hypercar Road is the standard. We can also put normal street tires on it. I suppose you could probably think of this as analogous to being street tires, the winter tire, and Hypercar Road, the summer tire, but both street tires, of course, so nothing too extravagant there. Pressures default to 30 PSI on the front and 29 PSI on the rear. Fuel, we're at zero here to keep the engine quiet, but maximum fuel capacity is 58 liters, and it defaults to 30 liters of fuel. Electronics, traction control, we've got two steps on the traction control as well as being able to turn the system off. Default value is step one. Alignment, camber and tow on all four corners, we can play with this. Default value shown here. And generic, just your brake power settings. That's it. You can't touch the brake bias, you can't touch the rev limiter, you can't touch any of those things, but it's a four-door car. So, this is a particular four-door car that has quite a bit of work to do. I'm not convinced that it deserves a place here in Aceto Corsa, even though it's already got its place. So, what is it on about? Is it supposed to be a track car? Is it supposed to be a road car? Is it supposed to be some sort of grocery getter? Is it supposed to be something that can get the groceries, but it's also fun at the same time? We're going to find out. Little detail here that we can see a little bit more clearly now that we've got the car alive and we're in the driving position. You can see that we have our infotainment screen there in the center of the dashboard, but all of its labels are in Italian. So we have radio, media, telefono, navigazione, applicazioni, and one other thing, impostazioni. Interesting. Those are the settings, of course. So interesting stuff. I do wonder if your your Quadrifoglio, when you get it, I do wonder if it knows your native language or if you're just going to have to learn some Italian to figure it out. So, anyway. Let's get this thing out on track and see what's what. Engine is a bit sluggish to pick up revs. Interesting. But here we are now in the pit out here at Laguna. We're going to take this very sensibly, of course, because this is a four-door car. It is somewhat heavy. Of course, nowhere near full steering lock to get this through the pit exit, because it's a road car, of course. It should be pretty maneuverable at low speeds anyway. And we'll just gradually 
bring it up to speed and see what's going on here. First thing I must say, steering is actually quite light. I would expect that from power assist on a four-door car. The car by itself is rather heavy, so I would have expected the steering to have quite a bit of assist in it. And remember, this is a V6 engine, but we've got turbochargers, so it certainly does fill the gaps very nicely. The biggest annoyance in the interior, and we touched on this in the live stream, it's that speedometer mounted front and center. Now, I'm led to believe that in the real car, you could change that center panel there on the instrument cluster to display whatever you want. But of course, Kunos have chosen to display the speedometer in there because, well, there's really no need for your radio or your sat nav, anything like that. So that's what we've got. But you will see that that speedometer is really lagging behind what the AC HUD speedometer is showing us. It's about a half a second behind at all times. So unless you're maintaining a constant speed, it's never showing you what's actually happening in the moment. See there in fourth gear, five and a half thousand revs, six thousand revs, 200 clicks, comes and goes. Into the somewhat complicated turn one, double apex left-hander. Bit of turbo lag there at mid revs. the car in. It feels very positive. It certainly feels stable. We do have traction control turned on at the moment. We're running step one. So this is the most assist you can have. If we turn it to step two, we should get a little bit more slip. Let's see. Turbo spools up a bit quicker now. And it gets to the power band and it pulls very positively all the way up to red line. With the corkscrew, you gotta take this slowly no matter what you're driving. little bit of neutral understeer and then a little bit of snap over steer on the exit there as the road falls away. Traction control coming in there through the penultimate corner. And this very tight final corner. A little bit of slip there from the rear, but there's going to be a whole lot more slip in a moment because we just turned the TC off. All right. So we know the car's not going to be a speed demon. It's got reasonable straight line performance, but it's a four-door car with a V6 engine despite the twin turbos. So what's it really good for? Is it good for going sideways? We saw on the live stream, yeah, it, it can go sideways. So can it do it again is my real question. Yes, it can. Yes, it will certainly go sideways. It's like second gear is what you need if you really want to get the tail end out. Otherwise it will just sort of plow forward. And of course we're not going to try to take the corkscrew sideways, no sir. A little bit of a neutral half drift, not bad. Over the exit there. All right, it will break the tail end out, certainly. That's always a fun little characteristic of any car, no matter what it is. Huh. 
Huh. There we go. Now we can start to get it sideways a bit. Second gear is the answer, but you need a bit of speed built up before you really jump on it. It's confirming that traction control is off. Right. Now it's starting to come to play a little. There you go. That's what it should do. And that's definitely what it should do. Yeah. Not bad. And that's overcooking it a bit. That's still reasonable, though. Even when it does get very out of shape, it's not the end of the world. Like, it didn't just start to pirouette endlessly toward the end of the Earth. It just, you know, kind of did a half spin and came to a stop. Not bad. There is, of course, a lot of weight to deal with in a car like this because it's got four doors, it's got four seats, it's got tons of leather in it, it's got tons of electronics. So yeah, it's, it's heavy, but the brakes feel adequate. The light steering actually kind of does belie the true mass of this car because it's just effortless. It truly is. I'm running the Thrustmaster TSPC with the Alcantara rim and, uh, you know, I'm just sort of letting the wheel slide through my hands. It's, it's quite nice. I wouldn't say you have a lot of road feel, like we go across the curbing here and uh, you feel the bumps, you feel the vibration, but it's nothing overpowering. It's, it's nowhere near what you'd feel in a race car trying to do that, but uh, feedback that you do get, it, it's, it's positive. It does let you know what's what. still waiting for it to really jump out and grab me though in the sense of I want more of this I mean yeah this is all well and good you can go sideways through corners and stuff like that it's not that treacherous but uh, you know is it something that other cars can't do no it's it's not at all BMW M3 and M4 in this game yeah they'll they'll do this too What I do like, though, is because the engine's in the front, you can use the momentum from the front axle to get the car sideways. And uh, ideally, you want to get that transition from forward momentum toward angular momentum done as quickly as possible. And with the engine being a V6, it's a bit smaller than its V8 counterparts. And of course, it's a lot smaller than the V10 that you'd find in the front of a of a BMW M5 from the mid-2000s, so it, it helps with the weight distribution in that regard. It does help with pointing the car's attitude where you want it, when you want it to go there. Not bad. Not bad at all. quite carry enough speed through there. You just sort of jump on the brakes and you give it a flick of steering to the left or to the right and it'll just sort of get itself out. It starts out always with understeer 
and then you've got to use the throttle to make that transition between understeer and oversteer. Gearbox feels good. I'm not sure if the ratios are a little bit too long. Seems like there is quite a bit of space between gears, which is, well, I guess they're probably thinking of fuel efficiency and usability on the road, but on the track, I think some closer ratios would be helpful. Especially if you're trying to do stuff like this. Kind of let the car pick its own slip angle and just react to that. The draw of this, as far as I'm able to tell, is going sideways. You know that it's not going to be the king of straight line speed. You know that pretty much anything else is going to be faster over the course of a lap at most tracks. But there are comparatively few cars that are as well balanced as this in a chassis dynamic standpoint. I mean, in your race cars with the super stiff suspension and stiff chassis, all of that, it's designed to go fast around corners, but it's designed to go fast around corners in the most efficient manner possible, and sideways is not efficient by any means. But efficiency does not necessarily equal fun. Going sideways and doing that, that does equal fun oftentimes, and I say in this car, that's, that's the magic formula. Overcooked it a bit, that's okay. I wouldn't call it agile at all, because again, you do have to deal with the weight, and you do have to deal with the overall size of the thing, but it is reasonably responsive. You can go sideways, you can drift, you can spin up the rears and, and hold that line as long as you want, really. It'll probably be a good car for people who like drifting. It'll be a good car for people who want to put together these really dramatic opening sequences on YouTube. With the slow motion, with the car going sideways and smoke pouring out of the rear tires, things like that. This car will do that. And in fact, if I really wanted to go out and drift, I think this might be my choice. Because it's, it's, it's very nicely balanced, and that was not very nicely entered. However, if you're looking for all-out speed, if you're looking for all-out performance, look elsewhere. It's just not that kind of car. Does that mean it's bad, though? No. Not at all. Not in the least. It's not what the car's designed to do. It's not supposed to be a fast track day car. It's, it's supposed to be cutting the difference between practicality and sportiness, and, uh, well, flicking it both ways through the corkscrew here at Laguna Seca, it's, it's sporty. It certainly is sporty. bad at all. Again, would it be my first choice? No. But then again, no car with a roof and four doors is going to be my first choice. If I want to go out and set fast lap times, that's going to be a Formula One car. But you can't compare a car like this to a car like that. They're fundamentally different animals designed for fundamentally different jobs in fundamentally different environments. This car is not at home on a racetrack by any means. Yeah, I'm proving to you that it can do it, and yeah, I would say that I'm even enjoying it because, well, we've been out for almost 18 minutes now, and, uh, well, I'm still driving it. I wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't enjoyable. So, that, yeah, there is a level of enjoyment that comes from this car, for sure. If you're a drifter, you're going to love it. You're absolutely going to love it. Me, I don't really like drifting. It's 
more so something that I do by accident rather than something that I do intentionally. But I do understand the allure of going sideways. So if sideways is the way you want to go, this will definitely help you in that quest. In terms of the sounds, you can hear the engine. It's not the best engine to listen to. It's a turbocharged V6 that's not revving particularly high, so it is it is what it is. Take it or leave it. Chassis dynamics, they're neutral, which is nice. You are, of course, going to get understeer if you go into corners too quickly, but you can use that understeer to parlay itself into a nice little four-wheel drift. Front end caught up with me a little bit quicker than I anticipated there. Arnold, oh, what's the verdict? Has it convinced me that it deserves a place in a Seto Corsa? Well, let's think about why they probably have included this car. Who knows? They're an Italian company. Alfa Romeo, it's an Italian company. Italians taking care of Italians. Well, this is nothing new, particularly from where I'm from in New Jersey. So, yeah, that's definitely had something to do with it. But then again, Ferrari's an Italian company as well, and we've got some Ferraris in this game. Ferrari, obviously, it's a little bit more legendary than Alfa Romeo, and they make some all-in-all -all better cars than Alfa Romeo, in my humble opinion. But Ferrari's here. Lamborghini is here. Maserati is here, and obviously Alfa Romeo is here. Is it just logical, then, to include another famous Italian mark in the game? And no, this is not by any means the first Alfa Romeo we've had, but certainly it's, the, it's among the newest. And, well, sure, it's a logical choice by Kunos. Italian company featuring other Italian companies. You help me, I'll help you. It makes sense from that standpoint. But from a driving standpoint, that's what we're really thinking about here. That's what this car needed to do to convince me that it's worthy of being in a sim that also features things like the Ferrari F2004. Does it deserve that distinction? Well, yes. Yes, it does. Only because, first of all, it's an Alpha, and it looks nice. And secondly, it can go sideways if you want. It's a four-door car. It does mean that it's pedestrian. But at the same time, there may well be some people who are playing Assetto Corsa who own a car like this, and they want to see what it can do if left to its own devices in a world with no consequence. Certainly, I like that idea. I definitely like that idea. This car, yes, it's expensive for a lot of people, but for some other people, $80,000 is quite reasonable to spend on a car. And if you happen to like cars, probably you're into sim racing to some extent. So, well, why not drive something that's sitting in your own driveway? I like it. Does it excite me? Not really. But does it particularly pain me to take it out here and throw it around some corner sideways? No. No, it does not. If I had to put a percentage on my convince meter right now, has it convinced me that it's worthy to be here? I would say 85%. 85% I approve. My reservation comes in from the fact that a, quite a lot of the Assetto Corsa lineup is still race cars or really exotic hypercars. And of course, you have legends in here like the 288 GTO and the F40, stuff like that. You've got the McLaren F1 GTR. So, no, this car is not in that league, and it never will be in that league. But it's not supposed to be in that league either. This is supposed to be a practical car that you can drive Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday or Sunday, if you really want to, you can go on a mountain road and have a blast in it. I agree. So, therefore, I will say wholeheartedly welcome to Aceto Corsa. Welcome to the Giulia Quadrifoglio. Let's push 
push it a bit into the corkscrew. When does it give up? See, when you try to drive it fast, you do get some understeer. That's okay. You gotta use the car's own angular momentum, and that includes the drift, <laughs> to help you out. Into the very tight pit entrance. You know, not bad. Not bad at all. Yes, you certainly know by this point that I was quite skeptical of this car, and on the live stream that we did, I definitely made that known. But maybe a slight change of heart now is in store for me when we're talking about the Quadrifoglio, because it's fun. It really is fun. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but you know it's not supposed to be the fastest thing in the world. Yeah, the BMW M3 or M4 will completely blow it away, but that's not what it's for. This thing is designed to go on the Highland Circuit, for example, and drift around the corners. It's not designed to go full bananas at Imola or Monza or Mugello and try to set lap records. It's just not going to do that, but if maybe you're having a little bit of an off day, and you just want to have a more relaxed drive, take in the scenery, maybe gather some really cool slow-mos for a highlight reel that you want to put together, this will do it. This will do that all day long on both sets of the tires, both the street tires as well as the hypercar road tires. It, it's going to do a great job. It really, really is. It's a bit more relaxed. It's actually quite stately, but the light steering and the propensity to drift definitely turns this car into something that you can have an awful lot of fun with. So definitely, if you're like me and you've been having kind of mixed emotions regarding the inclusion of this in Bonus Pack 3, honestly, let not your heart be troubled, because it belongs here. It does truly belong here. Anyway, that's going to conclude the commentated section of the review. As always, we do have hot laps here with the Quadrifoglio at Laguna Seca to follow, so please do stay tuned for that. Until then, though, thank you all very, very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this one. Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks, and we will see you soon. Thank you.